the Devils and Ray Shiro have agreed to part ways effective immediately. In the interim, Tom Fitzgerald will now move into that interim GM position. Cassian gets bumped hard by you know who, Kachuk. And Cassian's mad, and here we go. Now there's going to be penalties in the game. They've been going at each other on and off all night, and Zach Cassian is incensed. Yeah, I mean, well, if he, you know, doesn't want to get hit, then stay off the tracks. If he wants to react like that, we'll take the power play, we'll take the game winner, and we'll move on to first place. And welcome in, everybody, to another edition of Our Line Starts with Keith Jones and Anson Carter. I'm Catherine Tappan. Good to have you guys with us today. Let's be back. We've got plenty to talk about, that's for sure. All good stuff. Yeah, there's a lot going on right <laughs> There now. is, including uh, the Battle of Alberta. It heats up in a big way after the Flames' Matthew Kachuk and the Oilers' Zach Cassian. They get into a rough exchange on the ice and with the media. Who's right and who's wrong? More changes in Newark. The New Jersey Devils fired their general manager, Ray Shiro, on Sunday. What to make of the move and how can the Devils turn things around? Plus, Nichols Backstrom gets himself a new deal in D.C. and he does it with no agent. Sounds crazy, right? Well, our own Keith Jones has done the exact same thing. He's going to tell us how he did it. And, of course, there's a story to tell, as always. Plus, a conversation with Colorado rookie defenseman Kale McCarr. All that to look forward to. But we begin with what was maybe the most entertaining game of the season to date. The Flames' Matthew Kachuk lined up with Oilers' Zach Cassian with three big hits in their game over the weekend. That prompted Cassian to drop the gloves looking for payback. But Kachuk declined the fight. Cassian wound up with a 10-minute misconduct, during which the Flames went and scored the game-winning goal. And afterwards, both players had plenty to say. If, you, if you're going to hit like that, you have to answer the bell every once in a while. Like, it's especially one, two, three in the game. He got me in the third. He followed me in the corner, right? Like, he's clearly trying to target me, which I like. Like, I'm standing here. I, I love that stuff. I wish we could play him in a day and a half in, like, a playoff series, right? Um, this is, It was fun for me. Um, we lost the game. It sucks, but um, all in all, he's just a young punk that has to figure that aspect out in the game. It's sad because he's a pretty good player, but he's, he's a to be honest, straight up. That's, that he's, that's the definition of it. <laughs> he wouldn't fight me two years ago. Said I was a fourth liner, now I have 13 goals. What's the, what's the excuse now? You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, well, if he you know, doesn't want to get hit, then stay off the tracks. Um, you know, he's caught him three times there, so I think he'd learn after the first one. But if he wants to react like that, we'll take the power play, we'll take the game winner, and we'll move on to first place. Well, that is part of my game. I mean, I, if I don't do that, I'm not the, the same player. Um, you know, right now, uh, maybe, you know, the puck's not going uh, in like it was uh, beginning of the year for me, but um, you've got uh, you've got to be that type of player where you can provide stuff other than that to the table. And I think that these are games where um, you know we I think we needed um, I needed to play like that tonight, and I needed to to be physical and um, you know not pass up on a hit. All right, so we heard what Cassian had to say. We heard what Kachuk had to say. These two teams are going to play each other at the end of the month and back-to-back -back nights starting in Edmonton. Look out, Ace. <laughs> but what do you make of all this? You know what? I'm all for Zach Cassian, to be honest with you. I mean, it might sound a little bit old school, but if you're going to run a guy like that the way that Kachuk did, you've got to answer the bell, Jonesy. He went out of his way. He's talking about stay off the tracks. He went out of his way. Like, the body check in hockey, you're supposed to separate the guy from the puck. Are you not? Yeah. Well, he went out of his way. I don't care if it was a clean hit or not. Answer the bell, drop the gloves, at least put the seatbelt on him, tie him up. But you got to do something. You can't just skate away. That's brutal. I, I thought it was – I think it's awesome, number one, I think from both players' perspective. And I played closer to the Matthew Kachuk role than the Zach Cassian role, so I, I know what this is like. And – what Matthew Kachuk does, part of his job is to irritate the opposition to the point where they absolutely lose their mind. And uh, Zach Cassian is not the first guy that's lost his mind going after Matthew Kachuk. You think back to Drew Doughty. Now, it was a little bit of the opposite where Kachuk wanted to fight Doughty because Doughty's not a fighter. Mm -hmm. Cassian is a much more experienced fighter, and Kachuk doesn't want anything to do with him. So he's in an interesting spot. But his role with Calgary is not just getting points it's also providing momentum changes which he did in this game they ended up winning the game because he got Cassie in the snap it's it just makes for great drama do I think he should drop the gloves I, I don't think he has to but I think he should expect to take some punches while he's trying to avoid fighting Cassie and like happened in that altercation I don't think that Cassian should have been suspended for it 
I think he was within his rights to go after Kachuk as aggressively as he did. And he threw a couple aggressive punches late in that altercation, but I don't blame him for a second. And if I was Matthew Kachuk, I would expect him to do that. That's the reaction that I'm trying to get. So I, I think Kachuk would have been fine if Cassian didn't get suspended as well. The fact that there was a power play, which was mm -hmm. the result and a power play goal that ends up winning it for uh, Calgary, I think that's perfect. I think that's exactly what the game needs. I, I like that style of play, and I also like the reaction from Cassian. I thought it was great all around. And you know what? If you're Matt Kachuk, you can't say, well, I'm not going to fight anymore because Cassian almost has the same amount of goals as he does. So they're almost in the same stress. He says that now. too. He He's does like, say that. He said you wouldn't fight me when I was a fourth liner, but now 15 goals now. <laughs> yeah. He's got He's a, a legitimate point. Now you're Oilers. thinking that Calgary has Lucic on their team, and Big Luch's job is to protect the guys in the team. But you don't protect guys like Matthew Kachuk. You protect the Johnny Goudreau's mm -hmm. of the world, mm -hmm. not Matthew Kachuk. You let him fight his own battles unless someone's going out of their way to pick on him as a result. But I'm all for Zach. Listen, if Kachuk didn't have the last name for Matthew Kachuk, we'd be all over him. We'd be killing this guy. <clears throat> the fact is that is Keith Kachuk that played a hard brand of hockey, physical brand of hockey. We're saying, well, you know, Matthew Kachuk plays hard. But normally you want to see a guy back up his play that plays that way, that goes out of his way. Because he's trying to injure Cassian as far as I'm concerned. Oh, yeah. No, he was he engaged is. with another yeah. player and he went out of his way to try to make that body check and then not fight. And that's why Cassian lost his mind. I played in Boston when Marty McSurley <laughs> and Brashear got in that fight. Yeah. And Marty stick ran up and hit him in the head. Yeah. Marty lost his mind. Like, you talk about Cassian losing his mind. He lost his mind because he didn't want to get engaged. Rashir didn't want to engage with, with Marty. Yeah. And that's the issue that you have when guys don't want to fight. Yeah, and it wasn't like Cassian went hunting for Kachuk. He reacted to being hit. It wasn't like he waited for an opportunity where he could jump him. He waited. He was hit. He got up. He reacted. Those are the type of reactions that I enjoy. And it's really what Matthew Kachuk is trying to get him to do. So when I look at it, I, I'd love to see Matthew Kachuk continue to do what he does. But there is a certain element and a certain time where you have to drop your gloves. When I played in Washington, and Ace was there for a little bit of that time, we had a lot of tough guys. Really we had tough. a lot of tough players that I was in the middle of that pack. We had had like eight guys that had to fight before it would be my turn to fight, which was a great place for someone who played like I did to be. But Matthew Chuck doesn't have a whole list of guys that can back him up on that team. You mentioned Lucic. Of course, he can, but he played for Edmonton. He knows everybody on that team. It wouldn't be a sincere fight from hatred for Lucic. It wouldn't be. It would be backing up his teammate, which, of course, he's going to do, but it wouldn't have the same amount of uh, anger that you would normally see for Lucic. So the fact that Kachuk is going to draw other players into this Johnny Gaudreau can get run over if that game gets out of hand. And that's something that Matthew Kachuk is going to have to reel in a little bit because you're going to force other players in your own team and your own lineup to maybe get in some uncomfortable positions unless you drop the gloves at certain times. It happened to Claude Lemieux with uh, Colorado after he had the hit on Chris Draper. And then Darren McCarty had the, the incident with him where he went after him and changed the ent entire complexion of a series between Colorado and Detroit. But within that fight, our Avalanche team, which I was on, we weren't built the same way Detroit was. We didn't have as many tough guys. So we ended up getting, having Yui Krupp get, get injured in the fight. Patrick Waugh was injured when the brawl took place. And that's the risk, although it's a much less risk than it was in the past because the fighting's not there. The brawls aren't there. So I, I'm not 100% sure if that'll ever come to fruition, but that, there is a risk of playing that style for Matthew Kachuk, not just his own personal health, but the health of those players on his team around him. What about when these two teams meet again? That's actually going to be Zach Cassian's first game back. It's against the Calgary Flames. You know, is there going to be payback, Ace? What do you expect? I don't know if there'll be payback because those kind of games are high in the league's radar. <laughs> so yeah. everyone's going to be tuning in. We're going to be watching. Sure. Everyone out there at home is going to be watching. So it depends on the score. If the score gets out of hand, that's when you start taking a number. But first order of importance for the Edmonton Oilers and the Calgary Flames is getting two points. Two points first, and that's it. Now, if it's a 5-1 hockey game after the first period, My gloves might come all off. bets are off, <laughs> and it's going to be a full-blown yard sale out there. It, it might not be a bad idea for Matthew Kachuk to fight Zach Cassian on the first shift, and, and he may do that. I mean, he's within his right to fight whoever he wants to. 
And it might be a good idea for him to get out there and just drop the gloves. It's just a fight. I mean, you can fight people that are a lot tougher than you in hockey and survive just by the way you defend yourself and the way you grab onto somebody. It's not like you're subjected to being pummeled just because you're agreeing to have that fight. Matthew Kinchuk can handle himself. So it might be in his best interest to just go out there and fight the first shift. He can do whatever he wants to do, and that's part of what he does. He's that style of player that can irritate, but he also can look after himself if he has to. Do I think Zach Cassian's going to kill him if they drop the gloves together? No. Do I think Matthew Kachuk's scared of Zach Cassian? No. There might be a little bit that's going to get his heart pumping before that game, but there's nobody on the other side with the exception of two or three heavyweights in this league that you would not ever think about dropping your gloves and trying to hang on for, you know, a couple of minutes while you fight somebody. Well, you said it, hang on is the key. And that's put all you got to do. On someone. Yeah. Put the seatbelt on the guy, drop the gloves, put the seatbelt on, fall backwards, pull the guy on top of you, fight's over. And no one's questioning whether or not you're doing the right thing or not on the ice. Yeah. And he has, a, he's, he, he has the ability to do whatever he feels like doing, which makes for great drama, like heading into that next game. There'll be lots of conversations about it. Neither guy shies away from the mic. And really, Zach Cassian doesn't have a mic in front of him that often. So it's a great moment for him to shine. And he's having a very good season for mm -hmm. the Edmonton Oilers. And now we're talking about Zach Cassian. We wouldn't be if Matthew Kachuk didn't drive him to the Bateman, point yeah. of losing his mind. Uh -huh. So it's, it's good. I yeah. mean, I think it's a great thing, and I'm glad it happened. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people in these states might not be watching the Battle of Alberta, <laughs> but we may are. be tuning in now. <laughs> All right. Let's shift to Newark now, where uh, unfortunately not a lot of people are watching the New Jersey Devils because it's been a tough season. General Manager Ray Shiro has been fired. Assistant General Manager Tom Fitzgerald will handle Shiro's duties on an interim basis with the Devils goaltending great as well. Marty Bradour helping out. Uh, the change comes a little more than a month after Shiro fired head coach John Hines and the trade, of course, of 2018 MVP player Taylor Hall to Arizona. So this has been a really difficult season for the New Jersey Devils. Uh, they had so much hype coming into the year. They got the number one overall draft pick with Jack Hughes. And then things started to spiral after that. Um, you know, Corey Schneider had some goaltending issues. They fired the head coach, as I just mentioned, trade away their best player. And now general manager Ray Shiro is gone. So, uh, Jonesy, where do they go from here? Well, they got a lot of work to do, no question about that, but they do have time. I mean, they have the couple of first overall picks in Heesher and Hughes over the last three seasons, so you would not expect them to be necessarily at the point where they're a playoff team. Uh, they appeared like they were a playoff team before the season started on paper based on some of the moves that Ray Shero made. And I think it was probably some pressure from ownership to let's get this thing moving forward a little bit now. Let's, let's make ourselves at least in the conversation for the playoffs. Mm -hmm. And he was given the ability to go out and spend some money brought in P.K. Subban. Uh, Wayne Simmons signed in the offseason as well. Gusev was brought over. And when you looked at the New Jersey Devils, you thought, okay, this is, this is much better than it's been previously. And you would have expected that to translate it to the, to the way that they played it on the ice. Didn't happen. So you have to think that there was a conversation between Joshua Harris and, and uh, Ray Shiro about where the team was going to be at this point of the season before the season began. And they're not where they were expected to be. So the fans aren't coming out the way that you would have anticipated if the devil started to turn things around like it appeared like they would. And somebody had to pay the price. But it's very surprising because Ray, Ray Shurl is a very good general manager. He's an awesome guy. And I was shocked when I saw this. But it has to be about whatever his uh, conversations were with ownership on where the team was going to be at the midway point of this season. The team underachieved and under his helm and under his guidance and didn't meet the expectations that he set forth for the organization and therefore he lost his job. And you got to think they're looking across the river and seeing what's happening with the New York Rangers and seeing the exciting brand of hockey that they're putting on the ice right now. They're in the same position that Jersey was last year, this offseason. Everyone was pumped up to watch New York and they're battling for a playoff spot. Mm -hmm. But I think it's the Vegas effect too, KT. You think about Vegas when they came to the league, it's supposed to be a bunch of cast-offs. But all of a sudden, these guys are competing for Stanley Cup championship in day one. So that's really put a lot of owners and GMs and coaches really on alert saying, if these guys can do that right away, what's taking you guys so long? Like, I don't want to hear about a five-year plan. I want to get this done right now. It's let's microwave this thing. Let's not convection oven it. Let's microwave. Let's get this thing going right now. And that's a problem that you're seeing. But if I'm Marty Berdora and the guys, the organization, I would go and talk to Luke Robitaille. I remember when I finished playing in 08, 09-ish. I remember Lucky took over as the team president there in L.A., 
and he's really focused on the business of hockey in L.A. And hockey had a small group of fans out there, rabid fans, almost like New Jersey. Even though New Jersey is a big, big market, it really isn't that big. And you focus on just the business side. I'm reaching out to the community and really talk about the brand of hockey that the Devils want to play and getting that brand out to the corporate business partners and bring a hockey person in, like a Lombardi, to focus on the hockey itself and then grow it that way. Because if you don't, that the Devils just going to flounder. And they can't. Like, people think it's a big market. It's not a big market. The Devils are a small market team yeah, playing in the back of New York the City. The Rangers very close. There's a lot of people that live. Listen, I was born and raised in New Jersey. There's a lot of Rangers fans in that state, as many as there are maybe more than the New Jersey Devils. So, yeah, they have to appeal to the fan base. No one can get that fan base better than Marty Brodeur can because he was the face and is the face of that franchise forever. Uh, getting him out in the community, getting him involved a little bit more, I don't know, from a decision-making standpoint behind closed doors in the front office, but, you know, you look at Tom Fitzgerald, who's now in that seat, and he was in Pittsburgh when they won their Cups, Jonesy. I mean, would he be an answer to replace him on a permanent basis, or, you know, Ace I, just threw out Dean Lombardi's name. He's he, available. Yeah, there's experienced guys out there as well. Ron Hextall's mm -hmm. out there as well. I, I played with Tom Fitzgerald. I think he's a great hockey man. He was a very good leader uh, amongst men. He, he led in Colorado when I was there with him, and there was a a lot of leaders on that team and superstars and Hall of Famers. So he's very comfortable in those situations. It wouldn't shock me that he turns into an excellent general manager. Bill Guerin was also with him in Pittsburgh, and now Bill Guerin, of course, is running the Minnesota Wild. Um, I wouldn't throw out Tom Fitzgerald. I would, without question, make sure I got a good uh, sample size now while on borrowed time uh, the, the rest of this season and see what he brings to the table. I, I don't think that uh, ownership would be disappointed in what Tom Fitzgerald can bring. But there is experienced general managers that are available. Uh, and the one that was just down the road last year in Philadelphia is Ron Hextall. And you, you have to wonder if his name would be someone that would be brought up. I'm sure his name will be brought up and interviewed to see if, in fact, he would have some ideas on how to turn that franchise back in the right direction. It's a very proud franchise. It's, a, it's one that had won multiple cups going back, you know, over the last or couple of decades and were a very difficult team to play against forever. And whether or not the building was packed or not, the Devils had a certain brand. Yeah, Lou Lamarillo didn't he care was, that it was packed uh, and, or and not was, every night. That was he leadership. wanted the guys right. to play, yep. right. And that was one of the best general managers in the history of our game. Mm -hmm. So are you going to get Lou Lamarillo-type management? Well, maybe. But you need some. You, if you're going that way, you would probably need somebody that's got some you know, experience as a general manager in the National Hockey League. But you, you also have to embrace someone that will embrace people getting out in the community, too. Because as successful as Marty has been, I'm sure he could walk different places in New Jersey and no one know who he is. You can't say the same thing about a Henrik Lundqvist in New York walking down Fifth Avenue. People, everyone knows who Hank is in New York. But in New Jersey, Marty could walk anywhere outside of Newark and I'm pretty sure no one's going to know who Marty Brodeur is. He's one of the best You'd goalies be of all time. You'd be surprised. You'd be surprised. I've There's asked a lot, lot of people in Jersey, and a lot he, of people he's, are like... He's very well known in that area, and he, especially among his kids, went to school, part of them, you know, growing up in New Jersey. But let's focus on the ice, though, because I want to know, when you look at on the ice what the product is for the New Jersey Devils, they've obviously had goaltending issues this season, but where do you begin to fix things from the players on the ice perspective, Jonesy? <sighs> And the draft, and they've started with two first overall picks, but the draft picks after that have not been very good. So they have lost some of their depth and players that should be pushing for top six roles, like Pavel Zaka, have not met expectations that you would think that a player drafted where he was would meet. Um, I think that's where a lot of the issues are, have started with. So they tried to fill in some of those blanks through trades and free agent signings and, uh, of course, picking up a, a former Norris Trophy winner in P.K. Subban, uh, who also is kind of goes into what Ace is talking about is one of those players that can really get out there in the community yeah, and, sure. you know, bring people together and has that type of personality that attracts people uh, to watch him and what he does, not just on how he plays the game, but he's an interesting person to follow. And I think that was part of the idea of bringing PK to New Jersey was all the other things that, you know, he has been known to bring. That really hasn't had an effect yet. And that's something that I think the Devils need to do a better job of. And the one way you do that is win hockey games. So their on-ice product right now has been better recently. Um, they're starting to play to their expectations prior to the season. But this season, because of the division they're in, is really a lost season.
and they just need to make sure that they really show their fans something in the second half that they have a willingness to compete. They're not going to roll over and they're going to have little steps in the process of becoming a good team again. But it's not going to happen this year. I mean, they're going to they're going to bump along this year. And that's uh, a lot of that's going to come down to what they do in the offseason, who they re-sign, and who they go out there to add to get some pieces, including goaltending. And there's some depth in goaltending and other teams around the league. There is no depth in goal mm -hmm. in New Jersey, and that's got to get fixed. And believe me, they were spoiled for 20 years with Marty Brodeur in goal. You're not going to find another Br Marty Brodeur. Brodeur. You may never find another Brodeur, but you need somebody to come in there that can solidify that position. You know what could be interesting? Robin Leonard. No, his deal yeah. is up. Yeah. Robin Corey Leonard Crawford. Could be an interesting person. Yeah, Corey Crawford as well in Chicago. I'm a firm believer you build teams from the back end out. And... They brought in PK this year to help solidify that. He hasn't had the season they were expecting. Uh, they have Vaughton in there. He's been okay. Mm -hmm. Andy you know, Green has been okay. Mm -hmm. Severson's been okay. Like they got to build from the back end mm -hmm. first. They have the pieces up front with Hughes and Heesher, but they don't have the defense that you need. But they're going to get another piece this year. It could be a lottery team again this year. So I think they're at least four or five years away. But if you're a potential general manager looking for a job, this is a pretty good spot to be, Jonesy, with all the assets sure they have, is. thinking that you can build these building blocks and have a way to, at some point in the next five years, get where you need to go. And, and the, their owner, Joshua Harris, who also owns the 76ers in Philadelphia, has been extremely patient with the 76ers. They had five years of losing where they accumulated you know, top draft picks in order to try to turn their franchise around. They went from having nobody at their games to selling out every game and he has proven through that team that he's willing to wait. And I think he must have thought that the Devils were a little further ahead in their uh, evolution this year that uh, kind of forced him into making that change at the general manager position. So you can be sure he's in a hurry-up offense right now. He wants this team to turn around quickly. And if you're a Devils fan, you're probably happy about that. Mm -hmm. uh, whether you like to race sure or not, you're probably happy that there's some change coming and you want to see this team, your team, turn around and get back in the fight here. Yeah, for sure. A fight that, that involves a couple teams just across the river, the Islanders and the Rangers. Uh, all the hype surrounding those three teams. You don't want to be the third one <laughs> in that group, for sure. All right, well, we'll see what happens with the Devils going forward. We've got more to come on the podcast, including Jonesy's advice on how to represent yourself in a contract negotiation. Oh boy. <laughs> Did Nicholas Backstrom consult with you? He should have. <laughs> he got a little more than I got. Yeah, we'll Apparently discuss he did pretty that, good. <laughs> uh, coming up in a bit. But first, a conversation with one of the most dynamic rookies in the league, defenseman Kale McCarr of the Colorado Avalanche. Kale, a crazy, uh, crazy end to your collegiate career and the start to your NHL career. Have you had a chance to reflect on what happened last year with you professionally? Um, to be honest, no. I mean, I haven't really looked back on it too much. I looked at a few highlights and stuff, but... Um, other than that, just kind of kept going with the flow and, and trying to have get away from things for a little bit in the summer with it and get right back to it. Well, last season, take me through what happened from the end of you know winning the Hobie Baker and being at UMass and then getting the call to go to Colorado and immediately getting inserted into an NHL lineup. What was that whole experience like for you? It was a fast process. Um, everything kind of just happened very quick and. Um, I, like I just said, I, I was trying to just go with the flow and kind of stay in the moment and honestly just blacked out through the whole thing. <laughs> Don't remember much, but <laughs> no, it was a, it was an awesome experience and it made it very easy when I stepped in with the abs that all the guys were very accepting in the room and, and it was a great group of guys, so uh, I appreciate them. Was, that. was it a bit eye-opening for you? I mean, seeing these superstars in an NHL locker room and knowing that they're looking at you to come in and make an impact? Yeah, I mean, the first time I shake any of the guys' hands on the team, it's it's a pretty special moment. And um, knowing you're there and you have the opportunity to, to basically fulfill a child part of a uh, childhood dream. Mm -hmm. So um, definitely eye-opening, but uh, not to the point where you're, you're going crazy or anything. We watch you and we know what makes you special and we know what makes you great. But tell us what it is about you that makes you a unique and dynamic player out there on the ice and able to make that transition from college to the NHL so seamless. That's a good question. Um, I mean, the game now has shifted to so much of skating and hockey sense that I feel that those are two of my main attributes. And I think um, with the way the NHL plays right now, I think that that's just how I, I was able to fit in. And um, Again, I give so much credit to the, the teammates in the playoffs there that they just made me feel like I was part of them right away and um, it made me kind of play my game.
Were there certain things that you noticed when you were playing in the playoffs and playing at that level that you wanted to work on in the off season to make you better? I mean, yeah, it's uh, obviously everybody's older, everybody's stronger, and you're playing against uh, men in college, but these are these are actual men in the NHL, and so just kind of getting, I, I mean, maybe filling out a little bit and um, understanding how to work with bigger guys in front of the net, but other than that, nothing too much. Who had the biggest impact on you in Colorado? Oh, that's a good question. Um, man, there's a, there was a lot of guys. Uh, you could start with Landis Cog, McKinnon Barry. Um, I know everybody on the entire team kind of came up to me within the first five minutes I was in the room and introduced themselves. And um, Barry kind of came up and was like, yeah, put me at ease a little bit and was like, um, basically, I can uh, uh, easy league, so don't worry about it. So <laughs> um, no, that was, that was one thing that'll stay with me forever. So you win the Hobie Baker, you play in the NCAA title game, you get thrust into an NHL playoff game, and on your first shot, you score an NHL goal. Take me through that goal, what you saw in the play, and how you felt afterwards. Yeah, I mean, it, it was lucky. Um, we got a good breakout from the zone, and um, anytime Nate has a puck, just give it, give it back to him. <laughs> but no, he dropped it, and um, I was fortunate enough to kind of get inside position on the defender. And um, I was in a kind of bad spot, and so I just threw it on net, and luckily it, uh, it went in. But um, no, it was, it was a cool moment, and definitely went, uh, nice to get it out of the way right away. Who went in there and got the puck for you? I have no idea. Not, <laughs> but you got it, right? Yeah, yeah I got it. <laughs> Take me through this team, this Colorado Avalanche team. It's fun. It's a fun team to watch, but it also stems from that top line that is so dynamic. Um, and when you watch Landis Gog, McKinnon, Ranton and play, you have an opportunity to play with them on the ice. What impresses you the most? They're, they're just so fast. Um, they play the game very smart. And uh, you look at a guy like McKinnon whose transition is just lightning quick. And mm -hmm. um, you love playing with guys like that. It, it ups the tempo of the game and it makes it more fun for you. So, no, I'm excited to see uh, how everybody can match together this year. How surprised were you with the difference of the speed of the game at the NHL level compared to what you had been playing at a college? Um, I was a little surprised. It, it's playoffs, and I've been playing playoff hockey for a month and a half already in college, and by the time you get to the championship game, everybody's going full out, and if you're not going full out already, but um, so it was nothing super new, but uh, definitely it's an it's an amp pace for sure, and you're playing against bigger guys. There was so much attention around you when you came to this team, and, and a lot of hype, and, and deservedly so, but do you feel any of the pressure that comes with that? Uh, not really. I mean, at the end of the day, kind of pressure's kind of just made up, and if you choose to accept it, then then you're just going to kind of crumble under it. So um, I just try to avoid anybody, kind of all the outside factors like that, and just kind of play my game. You guys have an opportunity to play outdoors this year at the Air Force Academy, uh, Colorado, and LA in the Stadium Series game. What are your thoughts on the opportunity to play outside and to play in such a big event like that? Yeah, it's going to be special. Um, I've only played an outdoor game once, and that was at World Juniors, and that was pretty pretty crazy in Buffalo. There it got pretty cold, but. No, I was fortunate enough to go down to Air Force with uh, Tyson Jost in the summer and mm -hmm. kind of get a little tour of their facilities. So it's going to be an awesome one, and I'm excited to hopefully be there. Have you watched many of the outdoor games in the past? Oh, for sure. Yeah. They're definitely instant classics. Yeah, kind of cold, right? You have to adjust your, uh, yeah. adjust your gear a little bit. For sure. <laughs> what was your biggest eye-opening experience last year in the playoffs as far as you know being in the NHL and seeing what the competition is like? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> I gotta think about that one. I don't know. <laughs> it was the meals on the road. Uh. Um, yeah, honestly, just just being around the guys, um, just seeing how they how they live and the routine that they follow every day, um, just very eye opening. This, the I guess, how specific everything is. Mm -hmm. And no school studies to balance in addition to the games, right? <laughs> <laughs> this year, yeah. Minor detail. Other than you're on your own team with Colorado, mm -hmm. who's a player in the NHL that deserves a lot more love, and why? Man, um, my answer to this is usually Mark Giordano because I say he's most underrated player, but now he's won the Norris, so he's not underrated <laughs> anymore. But um, that's a good question. I'd have to think about that, so yeah, I don't know. Who was your defensive icon, your defensive idol growing up? Growing up, I watched a lot of like Nicholas Ledstrom, um, and then a little bit later on, Drew Doughty, Duncan Keith, and then more recently, like Eric Carlson type of player. So who would you say you're most like, if you could describe your game compared to another NHLer? I think uh, I'd compare my game to an Eric Carlson. Um, he's, he's super good in the offensive zone, knows when to read uh, defensive situations as well, so um, definitely.
Well, it was great to chat with Kel McCarr. One of the favorites for the Calder Trophy this season is the league's top rookie. Uh, he's fun to watch. He is a dynamic player. He has seamlessly made the transition from college into the National Hockey League last year, Jonesy. And he's not ahead of Olofsson of the Buffalo Sabres for points in the Calder race, but he's got to be considered as the front runner. Yeah, I, I don't think there's any question about it. He has changed the dynamic of the Colorado Avalanche team based upon how much offense he brings from the back end. I think there's an area of his game that's not there yet, which you would expect. That's in his own end. But offensively, he is unbelievably gifted. And you watch Nathan McKinnon go up the ice and do all the great things that he does. There's times McCarr looks just like him which is remarkable for a defenseman that ju is jumping up into the play. And you can tell that McKinnon and all the stars in Colorado appreciate having somebody that they can bump the puck to and know that there's a great chance it's going to come back to them in a scoring position. So he has been the most dynamic rookie this year. Does not look like he's slowing down. And you wondered last year when he showed up in the playoffs and you're like, wow, this guy's really good. If that would be like a flash in the pan thing where it would take him more time to develop once the regular season came around. That's not the the case he has been a superstar since this season started I thought the grind would kick in at some point you know mm -hmm. you get yeah. called up you're excited you're pumped you can't wait to play the National Hockey League you're playing in the playoffs you're playing just won the Hobie Baker backyard, won Hobie <laughs> Baker playing in Calgary hometown and I thought reality would set in training camp the grind would kick in and he would slow right down that hasn't been the case and you're talking about change Jones they moved Tyson Berry for him mm -hmm. <laughs> their number one defenseman who was an impact player for them down the stretch last year because they knew they had him coming I mean, part of it might be con contractual, but a lot of it's because of what McCarr brings to the table. Just that dynamic offensive flair. I mean, for a first-year player, it's amazing to see. I know the league's getting younger and younger every year, but Coach Bednar can put him on every situation. He's not afraid to play him. Like, sometimes you get to hide some of these kids when they first come to the league. He's not hiding anybody. He's playing in every single situation, and he's thriving mm -hmm. big time. Big time. Yeah, what, what's, what makes him most exciting when you watch him play Ace? Just like the way he skates. Yeah. I like the way he so skates. Fast, and he's right? got fast hands, too. And Jonesy mentioned the whole comparison with Nathan McKinnon on the back end. That's pretty accurate. Mm -hmm. I mean, both those guys have, like, the fast twitch muscles. When you see them stick handling the phone booth, that's what I like the most about his game. He's fearless along the blue line, too. When guys are coming at him, he doesn't move the puck. He'll give you a quick head fake, a little shimmy shimmy. Then the guy's going left, he's going right. Two strides, he's on top of the goaltender. There's not a lot of guys that can make those plays in the National Hockey League. And if you're at a game, you know every time that he's on the ice exactly where he is because he has such a unique style of skating. There's some players that you look and they, they look alike, but this guy's unique in the way that he moves. So as he's moving up the ice in this very unorthodox style, you can't stop but look at him and watch him blow by defenders, uh, blow past back checkers that are trying to you know compete with him and get back and defend against him. It's really impressive to watch what he can do, and it's, it continues to be an, an amazing thing to watch how some of these younger players enter the National Hockey League. They come with great confidence, and they don't lose that confidence, mm -hmm. which I think Ace was alluding to. You're waiting for him to have that moment where things start to bump along, and there's a lot of college, former college players that hit that wall around Christmas time. McCart does not appear like he's going to hit that wall, and that's bad news for the rest of the league. Yeah. All right. Our final topic, Washington Capitol Center Nicholas Backstrom has re-signed with the only NHL team that he's ever played for, agreeing to a five-year, $46 million deal with the Capitals. Backstrom negotiated without the help of an agent, dealing directly with general manager Brian McClellan. He said parting with his agent this summer was about more than the money. He actually wanted to learn more about the negotiating process. Jonesy, that's why you didn't have an agent, right? Yeah. <laughs> I'd no. like to learn more. It's, it's funny. <laughs> this is so, in, it's so interesting. To me, though, he did have an agent parted ways with him, probably knew he'd like to stay in Washington, whatever the reason is that he's publicly giving. He did it all by himself, Jonesy. That's not an easy task when you don't have the mediator of the agent involved in a big it's, negotiation like this. It's a really interesting process, and I, I did it in a much different situation than Nicholas Backstrom, who is an established star in the league. I did it after my third season in the NHL as a third slash second line player at that point in my career. I was in Washington. And my first contract I signed out of college was for 140000 my first year, 150000 my second year, 160000 my third year. And I had $35,000 contract in the minors. I had no idea if I'd make it up or not, but I did. 
So after my first season, David Poyle said, I feel bad. That's, that's not a very good contract. So we're going to bump up as long as you extend and take a few more years on your contract. So he went to my agent at the time. His name was Gene McBurney. And he told Gene, we're going to give 270, 280, and 300. And I'm like, that's awesome. So we signed this extension, and David got me for one more year, uh, which was pretty uh, smart on his part because contracts were going up exponentially at that time in the early 90s. So I played the first two years of that contract. I had one year left at 300. And we had signed some players in the offseason prior to that year. I had a very good year for me. I, was, I think I was second on the Capitals in goals and had a really good playoff. We lost to the Penguins in round one, but I had eight points, four goals and four assists and uh, in a seven-game series. And was feeling pretty good about myself. So, uh, Where is this we going? Had a, we had a guy on our team named Rob Pearson, who Anson will remember, uh, former Leaf and was traded for Mike Ridley to the Capitals. He played the entire year with us, and Rob Pearson scored one goal. One goal, and he was making $500,000. And I couldn't get this $500,000 deal <laughs> out of my mind. Like, I just kept saying, I got to get five hundred. dollars And I had a conversation with my agent at the time. I said, we, we got to get back in there and get this deal done. And he was humming and hawing about it. I said, oh, you're fired. So <laughs> I fired him. And I, I called David Poyle, and I said, David, uh, I just want you to know I'm representing myself now. And David, this, you got to think, I'm 26, 25, 26 years old. And David's like, uh, you are? And I'm like, yes, I'm representing myself, and I'd like to get together and meet with you. So the Capitals were unveiling their new uniforms, the, the ones they went to the blue jerseys, uh, at an event in D.C. And he said, well, come in for this event. There's like eight of us that are going to be there, eight of the players, and we're going to unveil the new jerseys, and uh, then you can come meet with me after. So I said, that, that'd be great. So I... Uh, Go to this event, and it's all great. And then David's like, uh, you're going to come over to you know the rink and meet? I said, yep, I'll be right over there. So we met. I had a pair of shorts on, a T-shirt, flip-flops, and a briefcase. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Came to the office. And I, and I came into David's office. office. At the beach. Yeah. you got to just think from David Poyle's perspective. When I think about this, it's really funny. So he says, uh, all right, sit down. You know, And I sit down across from him at this desk. And he's like, uh, you know, this is the hard part. He said, this is where it's good to have an agent because I got to tell you what you do poorly. And I said, no problem, David. I'm Keith Jones, the agent. The player <laughs> is outside the door. And I can just see the look on his face. I have a straight face while I'm doing it. And he had a guy named Todd Warner. This nickname was Scoop that used to be kind of David's guy to, you know, get comparables on different contracts and do all, all kinds of things that help, yeah, Scoop uh, did help, everything. help David out with all kinds of um, stuff that he may not have wanted to do. So anyway, Scoop would keep coming in the office with the list of these names of players that are going to use as comparables and I, I remember some of the names uh, one of them was Bill Lindsay and uh, I'd be like I'd open up my briefcase which had nothing in it it's completely empty I don't much like your briefcase yes, today. I don't even have a I don't even have a pen in it and it had a lock on it so I kept having to remember the combination which I I'd never used it so anyway I got it open I look in there's nothing beauty in it. and I go wow I never heard of him <laughs> And I'd turn and we'd start talking and I would say, I'd make my case to David about, oh, I think if I played with such and such, I'd have X amount of goals. And, uh, it, but, but the bottom line of the whole conversation was, if I have to make less money than Rob Pearson, I am not going to play hockey again. <laughs> and he was making 500 grand. So David goes, let me think about it. And, uh, you know, the end of with a, a good handshake and I left and, I didn't hear from David. So like a week goes by, I'm thinking, I wonder if he's going to call me. I don't want to call him. I wonder what's going to happen. So a week goes by, two weeks goes by, three weeks goes by. Now we're getting close to getting back to training camp. And Dave Poolin was on my team in Washington. And uh, he called me out of the blue at home. I'm at my place back in Brantford. He says, uh, Jonesy, it's Pooley. Do you have an agent yet? And I said, uh, <laughs> No, I don't. He said, well, I have one. His name's Steve Mountain. You should use him and, and get this thing done. You should use him. I said, okay. And uh, I, that's how I went with Steve Mountain. And Come Pooley on. called Steve Mountain and said he'll take it over. And anyway, to make the really long story short, he said, 
Steve Mountain called me and said he got me 500,000. Wow. So I played but a one year, year deal for 500. <laughs> I, I could, I don't think David ever wanted to give me the satisfaction of getting that 500,000 for that one year contract, but uh, I did get Have you talked to him yeah. about this? But yeah, we have. Talked to we have. David yeah. Boyle for, frequently. We, yeah, we've <laughs> talked about it. And awesome. we had some entertaining conversations. David was an awesome G GM and still is today. Yeah and uh, did a lot for my career, but I'm sure that's one of his uh, more memorable conversations on how to get a contract Why didn't he done. call you in those three weeks, well, Ben? He, he was really... just waiting for you to get well, a... He knew I would fold. <laughs> I mean, I guess, uh, yeah, I just I, I just loved having the conversation with the empty briefcase, <laughs> and I felt so satisfied. Anyway, when I got the 500000 I felt like it was like Backstrom 70. What did he get, 46, 46 million? 46. So I got $45,250,000 <laughs> less than Backstrom, but... I didn't have to pay an agent fee. I, go. I've got a problem. Oh, no agent fee? You waived no, the fee? No, he waived oh, it for so that I, year. I was going to say, you really didn't get the 500000 yeah, because you had to deduct the agent fee. No, you're... that was part of the deal. Really? With Steve, yeah. So, anyway, that's what happened. I know. I thought it was kind of weird that back from went in there. No, I always had Breeze. I was like, actually, Breeze is like second agent, Pat, second agent, second client, Pat Brisson. His first client was Marty Gendron. Did you play oh. with Marty in Washington? Yep, I did. He was yeah. a third round draft pick. Yep. The guy could score. So, that was mm. Pat's first client. I was a second client, and Luke Robitaille was his. Oh, very cool. And he played junior lucky you, at home. You just were about to say you thought this was a bad idea for Backstrom. You thought it was strange that he did it this I, way? I thought it was strange, but he had a lot of leverage on his side. I mean, you're playing there. You're basically joining the hip with Alex Ovechkin. And Ovi's coming back. You know Ovi's chasing Gretz's number. Mm -hmm. So he's coming back for sure. So he knew that he had leverage. Like, I'm surprised he got that much, to be honest with you. I thought he'd be in the eights. But the right. fact he got 9.2 yeah. is very impressive. You. Very, I mean, I'm pretty sure you probably went in there thinking that. 32 years old, 31 years old. Exactly. Yeah. I think the Caps probably said, well, as long as he gets anything less than 10, we're good. <laughs> because he's still producing as a high level right now. He's still an 80, 90-point guy. As long as you're playing with Ovechkin and Kuznetsov and those guys in the power play, mm -hmm. he's going to get his points. He's going to eat. So he's at 9.2. The number looks good right now. In three years, I don't really know, Jones. I'm yeah, really and sure. I think that's probably the expectation of it because – the Capitals have a window now, and it could be the entire five-year span that Backstrom's there, but realistically, Ovechkin's getting older. Um, some of their core players are getting older. There'll, there'll be a transition in Washington, much like we've seen in Detroit. Uh, the Capitals just hope they're as successful as the Red Wings were in winning multiple cups, and Washington wants to try to do that, and they look like they have a great chance of doing they it this do. year. You mentioned Ovi getting older. It doesn't look any older no, on the ice, that's for no, sure. He's scoring. <laughs> that's and the right. one good thing about Backstrom, too, is he plays fast with his mind, not really his legs. So you don't have to worry about him slowing down as a player because he thinks the game's so yeah. fast. Great teammate, too, really. Pleasant person to be around off the ice. A great teammate for all the Capitals. Good leader in that locker room. So, hey, congratulations to him. Yes. $46 million. Next time, call me. I'm available. Call <laughs> 10 me. 10% to ace. <laughs> all right, that's going to do it. Another episode of Our Line Starts. Remember, new episodes drop every Wednesday. You can subscribe for automatic downloads wherever you get your podcasts. We'll see you next time.